Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Santa Clarita Seventh-day Adventist Church. We're glad that you're here worshiping with us. My name is Rick Rofler. I serve as team leader for about 30 churches in the West region of the Southern California Conference. Today, around the world, there are about 17 million people worshiping the Lord. It's a great thing to be part of a larger family of God and to be part of this family of God as well. I'm out to change my world, not the world. The world is too big a place for me to change. But I can change the world as I know it and as I experience it. And the first change that needs to be made is not changing people out there, but changing me. Transformation starts with our hearts and our lives, and then we extend it to those around us. So today, as I share with you, please listen as, as I share with myself some of the things from Scripture. This morning, our overall arching thought is that in Christ alone, we find our hope, we find our center, and we find our story in Christ alone. Uh, he is our rock. He is our center, and He is our story. I love to study the Scripture, and I want to start this morning by recalling an Old Testament story that I believe has such, um, such a sense of humanness, such a sense of closeness with God, and such a sense of distance away from God. In 1 Kings, and I'm just going to tell you the story and encapsulate it. In 1 Kings chapter 18 and 19, you may want to read it this afternoon. It's a story that you probably know very well. It's a story of Elijah, called of God to serve God. And what a calling it was. I love the story of Elijah. I love the story from the way that God worked through him, the way that he honored God, and what accomplished, what was accomplished through him as he gave his life totally to God. To set the context a little bit, you may recall that there were three years of drought in the land. And that was a result of prayer by Elijah. Lord, teach these people. Uh, teach these people that you are the supreme God. Three years into the drought, on the plain, God called Elijah again. Now, you have to understand the context if you're not familiar with the story. The context is that there were true prophets of God and false prophets of God. So much so that on the plain that day, there were 450 prophets of Baal and one true prophet of God. Now, I'm not an odds maker, but I would be slightly intimidated, uh, even having a close relationship with, with God, to think there are 450 amassed here, and God is calling me to challenge them, and let's determine who the true God is today. And you recall the story very well. Elijah stepped forward, answering the call of God, and said, let there be a test today. Let it be known today and proclaimed throughout all the land who is the true God in the universe and who is the false God. Build two altars. Lay on both altars the same sacrifice. Put fire, uh, fi uh, put, <laughs> put wood under the altar. And we will, we will pray to our gods. And the one that is consumed, we will know who is the true God before the day is out. So the altars were hastily constructed, wood was laid underneath, the offering of sacrifice was put on top, the trench was dug around the sacrifice. The false prophets of Baal had first opportunity to call their God down from heaven, that the sacrifice might be consumed, that all might know beyond a shadow of a doubt 
that they were worshiping the true God of the universe. Somewhere, although it doesn't specify what time, possibly around lunchtime, after several hours of praying, the 450 prophets of Baal were gathered around with their incantations, with their talking, and nothing was happening on their altar. So much so, the scripture records, that they started to slash themselves in appeasement to their gods. As the day wore on, the heat of the day came on, um, their anxiousness prevailed, and they were crying out to their God, consume this sacrifice, we have served you. Still nothing. Long about the time of the evening sacrifice, there was stillness. There was still the praying. Elijah, led of the Spirit of God, ascended to the altar that was built. And he does something very unusual, just to make sure that all the skeptics in the land would realize that there's no trickery going on here. He asked that several vessels of water, I believe it was four to six, would be, uh, would be poured over the sacrifice. Please, please servants, fill uh, fill that sacrifice full of the vessels of water. Not once, not twice, but the scripture records three times they poured water on that sacrifice. Now, I don't know about you. It would be enough to just ask God to set that sacrifice ablaze without making sure it was drenched with water. So much so that the trench around about was filled with water. Make no mistake about it. Make no mistake about it. If something was going to happen that day, it would have to be something of God. There's no mistake, if the Scripture is correct in recording this, it had to be something that happened of God. It wasn't the prayer of Elijah. It was the answering of God. Elijah kneels, uh, knelt down before that altar that day and cried out, O oh Lord, God of the universe, show these people that you indeed are the supreme God. Show them, Father, in such a way that you will be glorified, you will be magnified, not me, Father. We don't know how long the pause was. What we do know, it was about the time of the evening sacrifice. And the Scriptures record that fire came down from heaven, consumed the sacrifice, consumed the wood underneath, and the Scriptures record licked up the water in the trenches. Wouldn't it be amazing to have been there that day? Would not it be amazing to be used of God the same way that Elijah was used of God? Oh, that the church could experience that today. Oh, that the story of Elijah would have stopped there. But it doesn't stop there. It has with it a great degree of humanness. The Bible records they gathered up the 450 prophets of Baal and took them down and they were ordered to slay them, to clean out and eradicate all of the iniquity and idolatry in the camp. As Elijah left the mountain, it says, he left with Ahab. Word went to Jezebel, Ahab's wife. Jezebel wasn't pleased. Her reaction was, so may it be with Elijah if he is not gone by sunset tomorrow as these prophets. Now wait a minute. Stay with me for just a minute. You know where I'm going because you know the story well. He's just God has just confirmed that he's serving him in such a way that fire came down from heaven in direct answer to his prayer. Is fire a symbol of God's presence in the scripture? Oh, wouldn't you like to have fire come down from heaven over your house tonight? 
Just as a sign of God's leading in your life. A pillar of fire, what? By night and a cloud by day. They understood the imagery. They knew what it meant. The next day, the very next day, we find a messenger coming to Elijah. The one who had just witnessed the very presence of God coming down from heaven. Within 24 hours, mind you, the messengers, the messenger delivers the word to Elijah. Be careful, Elijah. Jezebel is out to get you. Now, now wait a minute. <laughs> I, I'm not showing any disrespect any unholiness for God's actions. But I find it such a stark contrast within 24 hours of time how sudden human nature can change and be so fickle. Elijah somehow manages to forget that the presence of God in his life and his heart is filled with fear. And he's trembling before God and he doesn't know what to do. He's paralyzed because of this perceived fear that is to come to him. Elijah was the man who had prayed for three years that there'd be no rain. Three years and six months. And yet, his faith, his faith forsook him so suddenly. But listen carefully. If you have the book, Prophets and Kings, page 162, jot the reference down, read it this afternoon. If you don't have the book, you can Google it. Read this page, because it's a lesson that I want us to take and absorb into our hearts and into our lives. Because I don't know how it is with you, but in my life, I can feel God so close to me at times. And within a very short time, whether it's hours, days, or weeks, I turn around and I say, where are you, God? Where are you, God? I don't know how it is in your life today, friend. Maybe you're there today. Maybe you were there last week. But jot this down. Jot this reference down because at some point in your life, if the devil has his way, you'll be there. It may be tomorrow. It may be next week. It may be two weeks. It might be three months. But listen, listen to the words from the pen of inspiration. Prophets and Kings, page 162. Forgetting God, Elijah fled on and on, and he found himself in a dreary wasteland alone. Utterly wearied, he sat down to rest under a juniper tree. And sitting there, he requested for himself that he might die. It wasn't a mild depression. It was deep, deep utter depression. Is it not enough, O Lord, he said, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. A fugitive, far from the dwelling places of men, his spirits crushed by bitter disappointments. He desired never again to look upon the face of man. At least, utterly exhausted, he fell asleep. Have you ever been there? Into the experience of all, she goes on to say, comes times of keen disappointment, utter discouragement, days when sorrow is their portion. And it is hard to believe that God is the kind benefactor of his earthborn children, days when troubles harass the soul till death seems preferred to life. We're dealing with a very serious matter today. If I understood that correctly, the pen of inspiration says, not into the life of some, but the pen of inspiration says, into the life of all. There comes times of separation, times of doubt, times of confusion, times of distancing, Times of hopelessness, times of helplessness. So much so that the ending of a life 
seems better than that what God has in store of a hopeful life. It's against that darkness and that bleakness that I want us to go to the book of Ephesians. Because I want us to look at the book of Ephesians as a movement from helplessness, hopelessness, to hope, to centering in Christ, to the blessings of filling his story out in our lives. We live in a time of helplessness and hopelessness. A struggling world. There's hopelessness of life. There's hopelessness of, of depending upon where you were born. Having a life that has limited advancement. There are 872 million people that will go to bed hungry tonight in the world. That's about one out of ten. There are 14 million in the United States that are living in a, what they call a condition, um, a condition of survival, bare survival for their food. One out of 14 will go to bed hungry tonight. This isn't a third world country. This is in the United States of America. Physical needs that are not being met. There's the condition of being born into an abusive family relationship where you may have been abused uh, by your parents, by your siblings, by distant relatives, where your opportunities for education in advance were limited because of just who, uh, just where you were born and your family of origin. There are people who will never have the opportunities that we have today. But friends, I'm glad we're not serving a God of hopelessness and helplessness. I read an interesting study in doing just a bit of research um, for my message in preparation today. In 1950s, they did an experiment of learned helplessness and learned hopelessness where they would, take, um, they would take lab rats and they would drop them uh, into a clear acrylic tank. The unconditioned wild lab rats would swim anywhere from 30 to 60 hours. That's a long time. 30 to 60 hours is a day and a half to uh, two and a half days. They just swim away. Even though they couldn't get out, they would keep trying and keep trying. They took another group and they put them under stress. Most specifically, they put them in a gloved hand and confined them in the gloved hand until they would no longer struggle. They did that repetitively over the course of several days. They dropped them in the same tank, the only difference being that one was conditioned that it was helpless and hopeless to try to do anything. They dropped them in the water and they would swim for about 30 minutes and then just give up. Learned helplessness. Learned hopelessness. So I have to ask myself, and I invite you to listen in, how much learned helplessness, and how much learned hopelessness have I let into my life? So much so that the limiting factor on my life is not what God wants, not what God wants in my life, but it's learned from what society has placed in my life and the struggles and the constraints and the stresses that cause me to get so busy in life that I don't look out, I don't look up, and I don't realize what God wants for my life. Have you ever been there? Maybe you're there today. The good news of Ephesians is help is here. Hope is here. If you have your Bibles, open your Bibles with me today. Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. 
Our hope is in Christ, in Christ alone. As we look at Ephesians chapter 2, we'll notice uh, just a sprinkling of texts. God never fashioned us to be contained by the world and shaped after society. He created us in his image. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Let's, uh, let's look there together. So let's look at how God fashioned us and created us. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Verse 12, that at the time we were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers in the covenants of the promise, of the promise having, the scripture says, how much hope? No hope and without God in the world. So therein is our description. We were created by God to serve Him, not only uh, in the original creation, Adam and Eve were created and designed for eternity. When sin came into the world, death came. We were created by God in His image. We were created to be empowered by God to live for Him. But as we became aliens after sin with God, uh, after we sinned against God, having no hope. Isn't that what sin does to us? Destroys us spiritually and, and sends the message to us. How can you even come before God and ask anything of Him? You are worthless. You are hopeless. You've been there time and time again, and you're there now again. Whose voice is ringing in your ears? Whose voice is filling your mind? It's not the voice of Christ. It's the voice of the evil one. Listening to that voice will cause you to go down the path of hopelessness and helplessness. But in those times, <coughs> excuse me, it is in those times Thank you, Norm. There's a water bottle right there on the front pew. It is in those times of hopelessness and helplessness that God wants to reach out to us and give us the hope, the help, and the promise of His presence in our life. Can you say amen? amen? But we need to be careful of the voices that we allow into our lives. Verse 14 of the same chapter, Ephesians chapter 2. The promise is for His peace. Pardon me, for our peace. He has made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. And then in verse 16, that we might be reconciled both to God in the body of the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. So it's through Christ that we become united with God. It's through Christ that our relationship, we find forgiveness, we find grace, we find mercy. But let me ask you this question, friends. If it's through Christ, where do we fix our focus? Where is the center of our life? Because it's in Christ alone that we find our hope. It's in Christ alone that we find the center to our life. The, the center of our life and what we fix our focus on will determine how healthy we are spiritually. Oh, you can, uh, you can go to all uh, many different places to find a focus in life. Some people say all you need is self-help. Find yourself a good psychologist. Find yourself a good self-help. Uh, help book. Um, find your happiness in the material goods that you have. Find yourself happiness in your family. Find yourself happy in the church you belong to. Find yourself happy in being busy. If I understand the scripture correctly, there's only one source of happiness, and that's having our eyes fixed where? That wasn't a diff difficult question. Having our eyes fixed on Christ. That's correct. Our fixed focus must be on Christ. I like to use this illustration. How many of you have a smartphone? <laughs> Most of you do. Some of you will actually admit it. If you're, if you're of my generation, your phone is maybe 
two points of IQ smarter than you are. Now that's That phone is so smart, I'm not even sure how to work all of the features. One of the things in my smartphone that I found is there in the current generation, it indeed is an Apple, and if you hit uh, if you hit the compass piece on that and you hold it this way and that way and that way and this way, it'll actually show you where True North is. That's a pretty handy feature if you're lost, isn't it? And occasionally when we drive in California, uh, the roads are not laid out on 90 degrees and uh, somewhere the logic uh, got lost in naming them and it's very easy to find yourself in a cul-de-sac going in no place other than in circles. And you pull out your, your phone and you say, um, Siri, give me directions to get back home. Bing! And Siri says, 200 feet here, take a right, whatever. Or if you want to know what direction you're going, it says True North is over there. Now wait a minute, I don't feel True North is over there. I think True North is over here. Or wait a minute, I think True North is over here. Or part of the congregation might feel True North is that way. How many directions are True North? Does it matter how you feel? Does it matter what you think? Does it matter the conditions in your life? There is truth. And the truth is, as we center our life on Christ, we will find a oneness with Him. As we center and fix our focus on Christ, we will be less distracted by the cares of the world. We'll be less distracted by the frustrations that come into our life. We'll have more hope. We'll have more peace. We'll have more forgiveness. And when they, when they fill our lives, the emptiness will be, that void and emptiness will be filled with the Spirit of God. Do you believe that to be the case? I know you're out there. I can hear you breathing. <laughs> so I have to ask you, ask you, as I ask myself, where is your center? What do you watch? What do you talk about? What do you listen to? What do you spend your time on? What do you do with your money? What do you do uh, when you have leisure time? Who do you hang out with? Open your Bibles, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. We find there a oneness that will shape us and we can center in and we find our hope in. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. We find there that as we center our lives upon Christ, we're called into oneness with Him. And there's a, an amazing study in Ephesians chapter 4. This is a side note, no extra charge. There's a, this is a digression, that, um, just for a moment. There's an amazing thing in the church. There's this, uh, there's this kind of, how can we have unity in the church? And it manifests itself in many different ways. Well, you can't have guitars on the platform or drums. Or you must sing this hymn. Or only certain people should be up front because they represent half of the world population and not the other half. And there's a struggle within the church to define unity. I would humbly suggest, if you would read Ephesians chapter 4, uh, the entire book of Ephesians, it'll take you about 15 minutes. If you read it and you look at it from, from these aspects of unity, unity with God, unity between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, unity within the family, unity within the people of the family, unity within the community of believers, you'll find five levels of unity. And if we follow that, we'll find unity in the church. Unity does not come from uniformity. Unity does not come from anticipating everybody will be like each other. Unity comes in relationship with Christ, in relationship with one another, and allowing the Spirit of God to come into the church. Let me go back to the keynote of our message today. Ephesians chapter 4. For there is how many bodies? There are seven ones here in these couple of verses. There's what? One body, one spirit, even as we are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. It is this oneness with the Father that brings 
us the hope that we have through Christ. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19. And what is exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he hath wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him on the right hand in heavenly places. Far above, the scripture says, far above all principality, power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but in this, which is in the world to come. He hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. No room. No room for helplessness. No room for hopelessness when Christ is in all and through all. We have that faith. The last piece, just momentarily. There is indeed the hope. There is centering our lives in Christ. And then there's our story going forward that we share with others. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. There is the walk. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. There is the walk, how we live our life that will testify to others of the hope that we have. For I say this and testify of the Lord, that henceforth you not walk as the Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance of, that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. But, verse 20, but you have not learned so of Christ. If so, you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Going down to verse 23. So be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new man which is after God is created in righteousness and true... What does your Bible say? Holiness. True holiness. Man, I like that promise. I like that promise. God is waiting for me to come to him in my learned helplessness, my learned hopelessness, my utter shame, the confusion of my life. And he's saying, just be filled with my spirit and walk not according to the ways you've walked. Forget about your past and listen to my spirit. Put on Christ and walk in the truth of righteousness. What an amazing promise, isn't it? Now, if it's his righteousness and his power, who's doing it? I'm powerless to accomplish that. I can't change my carnal nature, but I know who can. I know that Jesus is strong enough to conquer the devil. And if he's strong enough to conquer the devil, he can fill me. And when the devil comes calling, he can go to the door to answer the door. There is hope today and there is a walk. But we have to let go of that which we cling to in our past and we have to embrace the Spirit of God and walk with Him. Notice Ephesians chapter 4 again. That walk will be filled with words and grace. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth but that which is good to the use of the edifying of others that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Be ye kind and tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. What kind of walk? A walk filled with the Spirit of God. What kind of walk in our conversation? Words, actions that tend to edify and elevate others. I don't know how it is with you. I struggle with that at times. Sometimes I leave people damaged, broken, and worse off. There's been more than on one occasion when I've had to pick up the phone or see a person in person. And I've had to say, you know, our conversation yesterday didn't go so well. And I value the relationship I have with you more than what I expressed yesterday. Can we back life up? Would you forgive me and give me a start over? Have you ever been part of that equation? Either on the receiving end or giving end? Life is better when we learn to watch carefully our actions 
our words, the way we treat one another. I'm glad. I'm glad that God is a patient God, aren't you? I'm glad that He puts us at times on top of Mount Carmel. I'm glad that in our fear, when we're running away from Him and saying, where are you, Lord? I don't know where you are, but I know you're with me. I don't know how you're going to protect me, but I know you will. I don't know how to establish that relationship again, God, but it's by your Spirit. It's not by something I'll do. It's not by something I can take credit for. But let me walk by the Spirit of God that you'll use my hands, use my words, use my life in some way to change my world one person at a time. Begin with me and then allow me to minister to one person. Is there one here today that might feel that desire in their heart? Let's pray together. Father, you promised. You promised us your presence, that you'll be the center of our life if we'll just turn and look to you moment by moment. You promised us, Father, that you'll change our spirits, that you'll fill us with your spirit, that you'll empower us, not through human wisdom, but from wisdom on high. You promised us, Father, that even in the fickleness of life, when hope is fleeting and learned helplessness is in our life, that as we turn and look to you, that the glimmer of hope the light of heaven will fill the darkness of the soul. So, Father, into the hearts and lives that are open to you today, minister to each one that they will be drawn closer to you. Fill them with your hope, your power, your spirit, that they might glorify you, I ask in Christ's precious name. Amen.